The poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling Doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth The forms of things unknown, The poet's pen turns them to shapes And gives to airy nothing A local habitation and a name. Hello and welcome to this edition of The Poet's Eye. Tonight with us we have a very special guest, Mr. John T. Campbell, who is a prolific writer. He is a Shakespearean actor, a published author, and he's here with us this evening to share some of his inspiration and some of his poems. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be able to share some of my poetry with you. I don't often get a chance to. Mm. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself and your, and your beginnings into the world of poetry and your inspiration. Well, you know, I started as a result of my grandmother uh, reading poetry to me when I was very, very little. She used to be a, an actress in her day and uh, just made everything fun and wonderful for me. And she encouraged me to, to write poems and she'd recite them and critique them to me. So I got an early start on that. And mm. uh, I brought uh, my very first poem that I wrote when I was six years old. I had just gotten back from church, having heard a lecture on, uh, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, mm. you can move mountains. And uh, I looked out the kitchen window and our little neighbor boy uh, was walking across the, the roof of his two-story house next door. And I thought, wow, what if he were to think he had the faith of a, a mustard seed and pretended to be Superman, what would happen? So this was the, uh, the poem. I swallowed a mustard seed, faith in all, he said, then jumping from the sky, thinking he'd fly, fell dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so definitely a literal interpretation of that one, huh? That's right. <laughs> well, John, you have a, a background in, um, in Shakespeare, and uh, is it safe to say that William Shakespeare had an influence on your writing? And oh, he had a tremendous uh, influence on my writing. Mm. Uh, from an early age on, I was able to see I grew up in Ashland, Oregon, the home of the world-famous Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And uh, as a little kid, I used to go watch their rehearsals morning, noon, and night every day. So uh, I became very familiar with his voice and loved the poetry and talk about influence. I, I like writing free verse, but uh, I thought, you know, he invented the Shakespearean sonnet and I thought I would uh, use a constricted uh, form mm. uh, to express myself freely in it. It's, you have a little rhyme scheme in it and a couple at the, at the end. And uh, one day I was 15 years old, uh, walking along the beach and saw a starfish on a rock. Mm. And I thought, what a stable environment this, this uh, little uh, starfish has. And then I saw two little kids come along with a stick, beat the starfish, tear it apart practically and all of that. And I thought, you know, there's more than just inner stability. There's outside influences that you have to be sure. aware of. So I put myself into the, uh, into the mind of a starfish. Hmm. And this is what came of it. A starfish to a rock am I to you. The sweet, insensible stability I cling to in my crawling hour. How true a curious gouge may stun, may cripple me, may tear from my design a reaching spray of arms, or from them scrape the bleeding pores like hungry mouths that mock my yesterday in looking on tomorrow's empty shores. How true the sun may scan my pilgrimage from morning birth to life's blonde afternoon. And in his sorrow, in his golden rage, burn up my brain and curl my heart too soon. 
But while I live and contemplate your touch, the sometime strokes of life are tempered much. That's beautiful. And you wrote that when you were 15. Yes, I remember distinctly because I was in uh, yeah. the class with a teacher that I didn't particularly like. <laughs> she said one day, are you trying to be literary? <laughs> wow, yeah. No, well, it's clearly early on you, is evidence of a gift. Yes. Yeah, and yes. I can hear the Shakespearean influence in it. It's wonderful. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sure as an artist you know that many times our our gift and our expression come from uh, a deep place within us. Um, can you describe a, a, a poem that kind of came from that? Yeah, would you say a, a deep place? Uh, grief often is a thing, and I, I remember my girlfriend, she was at the time uh, 33 years old, uh, movie star looks, sweetest thing in the world, and we were very, very close, and she came down with cancer and only had uh, a little while to live, so I thought I would write a love letter to her, and uh, the wonderful things that went on in her life, and uh, that uh, there isn't an end to look forward to. It's a, a, a new beginning of sorts, and mm -hmm. so I wrote this to her, had it, uh, uh, put on parchment, and I took it over to the hospital to give it to her, and she was asleep. And uh, so I just left it by her bed. But her name was Ella, and she lived in Olivehurst, California, so I named it to Ella in Olivehurst. Mm. I am never at a loss for words, and yet tonight there are no words. Your mother tells me you are ill and too asleep to talk. And I am heart sucked at the thought. I have loved you ever. And our sometime revels on this earth and off are so much a part of me that even now I live them and am fulfilled like a flower, long rooted, finely in the sun. I had lifted high my head, and the watery scenes were a blur with happiness. I could jump with frogs and take off on the backs of ever-winging birds. But my attentions, all too happy, were a temporary thing, as who could desire so much of you and keep you long. Mm. The pain before and after our affair lives with me, save for the sprinkling quiet in this toil of time at whose soulful and forlorn end a mirror makes me up and in whose face an aging image comes. I am taken with a flicker in a dancing candle. There is a message in my mind maddens me, and I stand in awe at my soul's quest. How easily it bores through monuments that mark us, and like a puff of smoke gives up in air. The flicker in some remove, universes off, hath a pulse, and keeps its music ever, though the ears asleep that once could hear it. I am not now as I have been, and will not be as I am, but that you are constant in my thought, believe it. In that, dear and ever dearest one, I am as I am and love you still. That's a beautiful poem, John. And that was written for? That was for, written for my uh, fiance just before she died of cancer at 33. Mm.
it's tragic. Did she know that you wrote that? Did, did you share that with her? I never knew whether she woke up from that because she was gone the next day. Mm. Well, that's from a deep place. It's a very deep yeah, place. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Thanks yes. for sharing that. I know as an artist that, um, and I'm a musician myself, and I know we can, as artists, we can be our worst critic. We can, yes. And, and, but sometimes we can reflect on, on, on our work and go, that's really good, or that's something I'm proud mm -hmm. of. Um, is there a particular poem that, you, you, for, that you've had that, a similar reflection? Oh, absolutely. I, I remember reading Bernard Shaw giving advice to young writers, and he said, don't compare your first with Shakespeare's last. <laughs> And that stood by me, but I, I met a person who became uh, the greatest person known to me in my life. And I wanted to write a tribute to him because of the incredible genius that he shared with me in his life. So I took all the exaggerations I could think of that would make uh, someone like that uh, at least acknowledged and put them together with uh, nice little tie-ins, and it ended up uh, a poem entitled uh, No Sacred Stranger, because he was a sacred man, and he knew no strangers. And then, of course, when he uh, was no longer in this world, uh, all I could remember the, is that uh, his voice was silent now. And so I started with that thought. Mm. Uh, when his voice is silent, I hear him speak. His memory magnificent beyond the smile in all marble. My small words in wonder of him deeper than all meaning. I blow the beauty of his breath back to heaven. He is happier in the orb of my circled sight than a robin's heartbeat dancing among the raindrops, brighter than all wisdom. His seed lies buried heart deep in my poem, as earlier his chest while heaving proffered a promise. His were the muffled cries caught in God's throat, spurting like spring to tell of life. He knows no sacred stranger. I feel the flutter in his breath. It knows a dream deeper than all destiny. It is all the light there is in heaven. I love that. It's beautiful. Thank you. Many artists are remembered for, you know, a significant work, whether it was a, a song or a painting or a sculpture, um, a poem. Is there is there a poem that you've written that you would say this is the poem that I would like the world to remember John T. Campbell? You know, there is. Uh, I didn't know it at the time. I don't think it was unconscious at the time. But it was after Ella died, and I wrote a poem of, uh, that had to do with my own aloneness and, and uh, so forth. I used to go out at night and, and walk, you know, out on the streets or in an orchard or something, and I could see the moon through the branches and the trees. And I thought, you know, the, the moon is a symbol of womanhood, and so I opened and closed this poem with those images, but I thought later on, uh, there's a passage in here. It is called the the uh, the Lone Rose, and I have an image in my mind's eye of a rose whose stem has been cut, so there's no life there. And uh, the image just devastated me to a point. So uh, I wrote that poem, and I think this is the poem that uh, I would say best fits your description in mm -hmm. terms of your question. I have transgressed the laws of my sumerial greatness. And now, for I am old and not given to winking of nights in the eyes of waking owls, for the feathering of their branches must perforce give off unseemly screeches and bulk-breaking sighs. 
to walk as I walk. Beneath the branches, the moon imprisoned in them, making my lone way like a stranger walking. And in the dark, too, the moon a-weeping at my small vision, how she's ever been the hob and heb of couples, squeezing juices in their palms, reciting psalms, clinging in the thrust of love's hard passion, the stars, the sting and twinkle of their tension, easing with sugar groans their lips to lick. And I, their absent fellow, stark alone and mediate, an emerald in the eye with youth gone by, echoing time sifters these shoes of mine, footprints of immediacy delicate and deliberate, or grown when morning comes with fumiter and long purples. I cannot last the thought of this, but in the intercept drop patience I awry, twist a dim gleam in the gathering season, obviate indeed the flowering poppy. I shall notice the insect on my cheek, allow distraction in small kind, the trudging anonymity of one so precious as this containment of life is, and let it go, the wiser. I cannot neglect the random swat of heaven, diminutive, unparalleled in nature as I am. Low as feet are to the earth, and with no wings by. I have no grace in flight, no ability in hiding from myself, mm. and must stay the circle I am lost in. Like the moon, my come and gui go guide of heaven, branch in prisoned visitor o' nights, handless helper, silent siren of my tears. What message is in this my ears will shuffle? I stop in midwinter, wrap my arms about myself in the white of words from my lips parting, calling to the skein of frost. I am cold, my boy. The sound is unassailable in the sweep of the echoing hills. But I have pricked my finger on the stem of the lone rose and let her color die in the agony of her fading into forever. No vial of perfume taken and none remembered for her short summer, a temporary holding of her beauty up to heaven, her face, these single tears away. I have no power to stay myself, no hold on the edge of my infirmity. My lungs crack, even to breathe, past thought, sighing anymore. It's a beautiful poem. It's uh, very self-reflective, and seems, and um, it's amazing how poetry can, and language like that, can convey one thing to one person and something completely different to another. Right. It's very, very interpretive. So when listening to that, it kind of just reminds me of, or maybe think of the smallness that we are and the vastness of things. 
Yeah, now, whether you whether you whether you intended part. to say that, uh, I'm not sure. But no, that was kind of how I it, it registered with me. I love that poem. It's beautiful. Oh, man. thank you. There are so many times in Shakespeare or other other poets uh, poems where there's a little piece of uh, wording and there's a million interpretations. And I learned a long time ago when you ask, is that may not be the right. It doesn't matter. It includes it all. Yeah. That's what a poet does. It excites the imagination so that you can be stimulated to have your own imaginings. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, well, as you know, as, a, as an artist and as a writer, that um, love can be one of our greatest inspirations, either Absolutely. love, love in, in the throes of love or love lost. In yes. either case, it can inspire <laughs> us in both ways. Um, is there a particular poem that comes from, to mind for you that was kind of inspired by love? Oh, yeah. I've written a lot of love poems in my time, but I thought, you know, this is a special program. I want to bring a special love po poem here. And this one I dedicated to a horse. It belongs to a friend of mine named A Bo. horse? Yeah, at the time. And uh, I thought I want to describe really what love is and what it does. And it doesn't matter whether your love is your fiance or your flower or your horse or your puppy. It's all the same and it comes from the same place. It's just a pulse at first, a hint of a happening inside me. Nothing extraordinary, a bird's chirp would be excessive. Maybe a nibbling at the glass wall from the mouth of a goldfish bumping unavoidably, unavoidably into proof of the invisible. A simple moving of some uncontrollable wonder, too small to make much of. A muffled muffling, like there's something coming and let it go to see what happens. And there it is. An ethereal throw in a lover's heart, quick as a firefly's light in one inexplicable place here and now in another over there, prefiguring a distance impossible to measure, a phenomenon in nature all of us knows and none of us understands, a communique, if you will, of the hope in happiness we desire another to know. Praying in our encounter, we feel a little less alone, if a little less profound in the mind of the universe. Hmm. That's wonderful. What do you think your um, most challenging subject that you've tackled, what would you think that is? Well, every once in a while I'll be in a, an editor's office or around publishing and all of a sudden they're going to press and they need filler. Hmm. So one day uh, uh, one of the editors handed me a, an illustration of a man holding onto a rock out in the middle of the ocean. He said, write a poem on this. We need it immediately. So I said, death at sea. And this was uh, what I imagined myself to be in clinging to that rock. It had been a happy time for me pursuing antiquity, fingering the crumpled remnants of my journey's log, going for answers on the frantic disposition of the water gods, Titan, with his portentous minnows prefiguring with a yawn absolute disaster, and Neptune wreathed in triumph, horn blasting a league of sea nymphs who could no longer abjure his terrible summons. My ship, lost, for adventure without warning, I am alone upon the sea, beating the waves with my bobbing and wretched self, clinging at last to the last in my soaked suffering, a pendant rock jutting from hell, Hung I in the wake with a compromise to life, out distancing death, and gathering myself home without the benison of my absent mates. I fall to it now in a quieter sort, though inhumation follows. I will not sail again, <laughs> and nor, alas, will they. Love that. So have you been challenged to ever write a poem on the spot? Oh, many a time and oft. Uh, here is one that I like. Some, we were watching, uh, 
Oh, it was a, kind of a documentary on the Big Bang Theory, how the universe got here. And they said, write a poem, and I did, and this is it. I am like the last Gufa echoing through all time and with no ears by to make sense of it. No laughs anymore, no sequels of delight after the first encounter. Only a transmogrified visage broken in the sand, a mere frown in the residual mountain I could once see nudging heaven. You are my joy, the quiet memory of what was a soft experiment in life, easily taking off, then falling to pieces. A reality never as rainbows flashing in rain, but as blackness binding the universe, crushing so that the last light oozing explodes in twinkles. And you did that one on the spot. On the spot. I love that. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, that's been, uh, this is our close for uh, this edition of The Poet's Eye. I hope you enjoyed it as uh, much as I did. And uh, thank you again, uh, John, for joining us. Your uh, poems are inspirational and really enjoyed them. And would you close us with a poem of your choice? I would love to do that. And thank you for inviting me. It was an honor for me. Uh, I'd like to leave you with words that... Uh, Shakespeare left posterity when he said farewell to the theater that he had served so long. Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, are all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air, and like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temple, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve, and like this unsubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep.